Ancient America in Notes on American Archaeology by John D. Baldwin. Appendix A. The Northmen in America. It is generally known, I suppose, that original manuscript records of Norse voyages to this continent have been carefully preserved in Iceland and that they were first published at Copenhagen in 1837 with a Danish and Latin translation. These narratives are plain, straightforward, business-like accounts of actual voyages made by the Northmen in the 10th and 11th centuries to Greenland, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, and the coast of Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Within the whole range of the literature of discovery and adventure, no volumes can be found which have more abundant internal evidence of authenticity. It always happens when something important is unexpectedly added to our knowledge of the past that somebody will blindly disbelieve. Dugald Stewart could see nothing but frauds of arch forgers in what was added to our knowledge of ancient India when the Sanskrit language and literature were discovered. In the same way, here and there, a doubter has hesitated to accept the fact communicated by these Norse records, but with the evidence before us, we may as reasonably doubt any unquestioned fact of history which depends on similar testimony. Any account of these voyages should be prefaced by some notice of Iceland. Look at a map at the position of Iceland and you will see at once that it should not be classed as a European island. It belongs to North America. It was, in fact, unknown to modern Europe until the year 861 AD when it was discovered by Nadad, a Norse rover. There is some reason to believe the Irish had previously sailed to this island, but no settlement was established in it previous to the year 875, when it was occupied by a colony of Norwegians under a chief named Ingolf. Owing to civil troubles in Norway, he was soon followed by many of the most intelligent, wealthy, and honorable of his countrymen. Thus, Iceland away in the northern ocean became a place of great interest. In the 10th and 11th centuries, the Icelanders had become eminent among the Norse communities for intellectual culture and accomplishment. They were far superior to their countrymen in Norway. To them we are indebted for the existing records of Scandinavian mythology. They were daring and adventurous navigators, and when we consider how near Iceland is to America, it should not surprise us to hear that they found the American continent. On the contrary, it would have been surprising if they had failed to find it. They first discovered Greenland, and in 892 established a colony there. Afterwards, in the course of many voyages, they explored the coast of America much further south. Narratives of some of these voyages were carefully written and preserved. There are two principal records. One is entitled, An Account of Eric the Red and Greenland. This appears to have been written in Greenland, where Eric settled, and where the Northmen had a colony consisting of 280 settlements. The other record is an account of Thorfinn Karselfne. This was written in Iceland by a bishop, one of Thorfinn's immediate descendants. The Norse narrative introduces Eric's voyage of discovery as follows. There was a man of noble family whose name was Thorvald. He and his son Eric, surnamed the Red, were obliged to flee from Jadir in the southwest part of Norway because in some feud that arose they committed a homicide. They went to Iceland, which at that time was thoroughly colonized. Thorvald died soon after reaching Iceland, but Eric inherited his restless spirit. The record says he was at length involved in another feud in Iceland. Eric, being unjustly treated by some of his neighbors, committed another homicide, and the narrative relates what followed. Having been condemned by the court, he resolved to leave Iceland. His vessel being prepared and everything ready, Eric's partisans in the quarrel accompanied him some distance. He told them he had determined to quit Iceland and settle somewhere else, adding that he was going in search of the land Gunnaborn, 
had seen when driven by a storm into the Western Ocean and promising to revisit them if his search should be successful. Sailing from the western side of Iceland, Eric steered boldly to the west. At length, he found land and called the place Midjokul. Then, coasting along the shore in a southerly direction, he sought to find a place more suitable for settlement. He spent the winter on a part of the coast which he named Eric's Island. A satisfactory situation for his colony was found, and he remained there two years. On returning to Iceland, he called the discovery country Greenland, saying to his confidential friends, A name so inviting will induce men to emigrate thither. Finally, he went again to Greenland, accompanied by 25 ships, filled with emigrants and stores, and his colony was established. This happened, says the Chronicle, 15 winters before the Christian religion was introduced into Iceland. That is to say, Eric made his second voyage to Greenland 15 years previous to 1000 AD. Bjarni, son of Heriulf, a chief man among these colonists, was absent in Norway when his father left Iceland. On returning, he decided to follow and join the colony. Although neither he nor any of his companions had ever seen Greenland or sailed on the Greenland Ocean. Having arranged his business, he set sail and made one of the most remarkable and fearful voyages on record. On leaving Iceland, they sailed three days with a fair wind. Then arose a storm of northeasterly winds accompanied by very cloudy, thick weather. They were driven before the storm for many days. They knew not whither. At length, the weather cleared, and they could see the sky. They then sailed west another day and saw land different from any they had previously known, for it was not mountainous. In reply to the anxious sailors, Bjarni said this could not be Greenland. They put the ship about and steered in a northeasterly direction two days more. Again, they saw land which was low and level. Bjarni thought this could not be Greenland. For three more days they sailed in the same direction and came to a land that was mountainous and covered with ice. This proved to be an island around which they sailed. Steering towards the north, they sailed four days and again discovered land, which Bjarni thought was Greenland, and so it proved. They were on the southern coast near the new settlement. It is manifest that the first land Bjarni saw was either Nantucket or Cape Cod, the next was Nova Scotia around Cape Sable, and the island around which they coasted was Newfoundland. This voyage was made 507 years earlier than the first voyage of Columbus. Bjarni's report of his discoveries was heard with great interest and caused much speculation, but... The settlers in Greenland were too busy making their new homes to undertake voyages in that direction immediately. Fourteen years later, Leif, a son of Eric the Red, being in Norway, was incited to fit out an expedition to go in search of the strange lands Bjarni had seen. On returning to Greenland, he had an interview with Bjarni and brought his ship, which he fitted out and manned with 35 men. The first land seen by Leif after he sailed from Greenland was the island around which Bjarni sailed. This he named Haluland, the land of broad shores. Sailing on towards the south, they came next to a land that was low and level and covered with wood. This they called Markland, the land of woods. The narrative goes on. They now put to sea with a northeast wind and sailing still towards the south after two days touched an island, Nantucket, question mark, which lay opposite the northeast part of the mainland. Then they sailed through a bay between the island and a cape running northeast and going westward sailed past the cape. At a length they passed up a river into a bay where they landed they had probably reached Mount Hope Bay. They constructed rude dwellings and prepared to spend the winter at this place. It was about mid-autumn, and finding wild grapes, they called the country Vinland. Leif and his people were much pleased with the mildness of climate and goodness of the soil. 
The next spring, they loaded their vessels with timber and returned to Greenland, where Eric the Red, having died, Leif inherited his estate and authority and left exploring expeditions to others. The next year, Leif's brother, Thorvald, went to Vinland with one ship and 30 men, and there passed the winter. The following summer, he explored the coast westward and southward and seems to have gone as far south as the Carolinas. In the autumn, they returned to Vinland, where they passed another winter. The next summer, they coasted around Cape Cod towards Boston Harbor, and getting around on Cape Cod, they called it Kielarnis, Keel Cape. Here, the chronicle first speaks of the natives whom it calls Skraelings. It says they perceived on the sandy shore of the bay three small elevations. On going to them, they found three boats made of skins, and under each boat, three men. They seized all the men but one, who was so nimble as to escape with his boat, and they killed all those whom they had taken. The doctrine of natural enemies was more current among the old Northmen than that of human brotherhood. The retribution followed swiftly. They were presently attacked by a swarm of natives in boats. The Skrælings were beaten off, but Thorvald, being fatally wounded in the skirmish, died and was buried on a neighboring promontory. His companions, after passing a third winter in Vinland, returned to Greenland, having been absent three years. This, considering the circumstances, was an adventurous voyage, a brave exploring expedition sent from the Arctic regions to make discoveries in the mysterious world at the south. On reading the narrative, one longs for more ample accounts of the voyage which would have been given if Thorvald himself had lived to return. The account of Eric the Red and Greenland tells of an expedition planned by Eric's youngest son, Thorstein, which was prevented by Thorstein's death. It relates the particulars of a voyage to Vinland made by Eric's daughter, Freydis, with her husband and his two brothers. Freydis is described as a cruel, hard-hearted, enterprising woman, mindful only of gain. The chronicle says her husband, named Thorvald, was weak-minded, and that she married him because he was rich. During the voyage, she contrived to destroy her husband's brothers and seize their ship, for which evil deed she was made to feel her brother Leif's anger on her return. The same chronicle gives an account of a voyage northward up Baffin's Bay and through what is now called Wellington Channel. There is also a romantic story of Thorstein's widow, Gudrid, an exceedingly beautiful and noble-minded woman, which tells us how she was courted and married by Thorfinn Karlsefne, a man of distinguished character and rank who came from Iceland with ships and was entertained by Leif. Thorfinn came to Greenland in the year 1006, and having married Gudrid, Thorstein's widow, was introduced by her to undertake a voyage to Vinland. They left Greenland with three ships and 160 men, taking with them livestock and all things necessary to the establishment of a colony. The vessels touched at Newfoundland and Nova Scotia, and having reached Vinland, they passed up Buzzards Bay, disembarked their livestock, and preparations were made for winter residence. Here they passed the winter, and here Gudrid gave birth to a son who lived and grew to manhood, and among those lineal descendants was Thorvaldsen, the Danish sculptor. The winter was severe. Their provisions began to fail, and they were threatened with famine. This occasioned many anxieties and some adventures. One of the company, a fierce, resolute man, bewailed their apostasy from the old religion and declared that to find relief they must return to the worship of Thor. But they found a supply of provisions without trying this experiment. Thor's worshipper afterward left the company with a few companions to pursue an expedition of his own and was killed by the natives. The next spring, Thorfinn explored the coast farther west and south. Then he went to the bay where Leif spent the winter and there passed his second winter in Vinland. He called the bay Hop. The Indians called it Haup, 
We call it hope. During the next season, they saw many natives and had much intercourse with them, which finally led to hostilities. The natives in great numbers attacked them fiercely, but were signally defeated. Freydis, being with the company, fought desperately in this battle and greatly distinguished herself as a terrible combatant, although in that peculiar condition which does not specially qualify a woman for such exploits. Thorfinn afterward explored Massachusetts Bay, spent a third winter in Vinland, and then, with part of the company, he returned to Greenland. He finally went back to his home in Iceland, and there remained during the rest of his life. The Indians had traditions which appear to have preserved recollections of these visits of the Northmen. In 1887, Michael Lort, vice president of the London Antiquarian Society, published a work in which he quoted the following extract of a letter from New England, dated more than a half century earlier. There was a tradition current with the oldest Indians in these parts that there came a wooden house and men of another country in it, swimming up the Asunet, as this Tautan River was then called, who fought the Indians with mighty success. There was now a settlement in Vinland at Hop Bay, and voyagers to that region became frequent. The Old Norse narrative says... Expeditions to Vinland now become very frequent matters of consideration, for these expeditions were considered both lucrative and honorable. The following appears in Wheaton's History of the Northmen. A part of Thorfinn's company remained in Vinland and were afterward joined by two Icelandic chieftains. In the year 1059, it is said an Irish or Saxon priest named John, or John, J-O-H-N, who had spent some time in Iceland, went to preach to the colonists in Vinland, where he was murdered by the heathen. The following is from the introduction to Henderson's Iceland. In the year 1121, Eric, Bishop of Greenland, made a voyage to Vinland. Thus it appears to be an authenticated fact that the Northmen had a settlement or settlements in New England 600 years previous to the arrival of English settlers. It is probable that their Vinland settlements consisted chiefly of trading and lumbering establishments. The first explorers loaded their vessels with timber when ready to return to Greenland, where the lack of timber was so great that the settlers found it necessary to use stone for building material. The Vinland timber trade became naturally an important business, but neither Greenland nor Iceland could furnish emigrants to occupy the country. Traces of the Old North settlements in Greenland are still visible in the ruins of stone buildings. Near the Bay of Egalito in Greenland are remains of a stone church. Vinland was covered with great forests, and there it was much easier and cheaper to build houses of wood. The Norse records speak also of a region south of Vinland to which voyages were made. It is called Huitramanaland. Indeed, two great regions farther south are mentioned. There is a romantic story of one Bjorn Asbranson, a noble Icelander who, being crossed in his matrimonial desires, went away towards Vinland, but his vessel was driven much farther south by a storm. Nothing was heard of him until part of the crew of a Norse vessel on a voyage to Hutramanaland were captured by the natives, among whom Bjorn was living as a chief. He discovered an old acquaintance among the prisoners whom he found means to release. He talked freely with his old friend of the past and of Iceland, but would not leave his savage friends. How little we know of what has been in the past ages, notwithstanding our many volumes of history. We listen attentively to what gets a wide and brilliant publication and either fail to hear or doubt everything else. If these Norse adventurers had sailed from England or Spain, those countries being what they were in the time of Columbus, their colonies would not have failed, though lack of men and means to support and extend them and the story of their discoveries would have been told in every language and community of the civilized world. But the little communities in Iceland and Greenland were very different from rich and powerful nations. Instead of being in direct communication with the great movements of human life in Europe, recorded in what we read as history, 
They were far off in the Northern Ocean and, out of Norway, almost unknown to Europe. Afterward, when the name and discoveries of Columbus had taken control of thought and imagination, it became difficult for even intelligent men with the Old Norse records before them to see the claims of the Northmen. B. The Welsh in America The story of the immigration to America of Prince Madoc or Madaj is told in the Old Welsh books as follows. About the year 1168 or 1169 AD, Owen Gwynedd, ruling prince of North Wales, died. And among his sons there was a contest for the succession which, became angry and fierce, produced a civil war. His son Madoc, who had command of the fleet, took no part in this strife. Greatly disturbed by the public trouble and not being able to make the combatants hear reason, he resolved to leave Wales and go across the ocean to the land at the west. Accordingly, in the year 1170 AD, he left with a few ships, going south of Ireland and steering westward. The purpose of this voyage was to explore the western land and select a place for settlement. He found a pleasant and fertile region where his settlement was established. Leaving 120 persons, he returned to Wales, prepared 10 ships, prevailed on a large company, some of whom were Irish, to join him, and sailed again to America. Nothing more was ever heard in Wales of Prince Maddock or his settlement. All this is related in old Welsh annals preserved in the abbeys of Conway and Strathfleur. These annals were used by Humphrey Lwyd in his translation and continuation of Caradoc's History of Wales, the continuation extending from 1157 to 1270 AD. This emigration of Prince Madaj is mentioned in the preserved works of several Welsh bards who lived before the time of Columbus. It is mentioned by Hakluyt, who had his account of it from writings of the bard Guten Owen, as the Northmen had been in England over 150 years when Prince Madaj went forth to select a place for his settlement. He knew very well there was a continent on the other side of the Atlantic, for he had knowledge of their voyage to America, and knowledge of them was also prevalent in Ireland. His emigration took place when Henry II was king of England, but in that age the English knew little or nothing of Welsh affairs in such a way as to connect them with English history very closely. It is supposed that Madaj settled somewhere in the Carolinas and that his colony, unsupported by new arrivals from Europe and cut off from communication with that side of the ocean, became weak and after being much reduced was destroyed or absorbed by some powerful tribe of Indians. In our colony times and later, there was no lack of reports that relics of Madaja's Welshmen and even their language had been discovered among the Indians, but generally they were entitled to no credit. The only report of this kind having any show of claim to respectful consideration is that of Reverend Morgan Jones made in 1686 in a letter giving an account of his adventures among the Tuscaroras. These Tuscarora Indians were lighter in color than the other tribes, and this peculiarity was so noticeable that they were frequently mentioned as white Indians. Mr. Jones's account of his experiences among them was written in March 1686 and published in the Gentleman's Magazine for the year 1740, as follows. Reverend Morgan Jones's statement. These presents certify all persons, whatever, that in the year 1660, being an inhabitant of Virginia and chaplain to Major General Bennett of Mansoman County, the said Major General Bennett and Sir William Berkeley sent two ships to Port Royal, now called South Carolina which is sixty leagues southward of Cape Fair, and I was sent therewith to be their minister. 
Upon the 8th of April, we set out from Virginia and arrived at the harbor's mouth of Port Royal the 19th of the same month, where we waited for the rest of the fleet that was to sail from Barbados and Bermuda with one Mr. West, who was to be deputy governor of said place. As soon as the fleet came in, the smallest vessels that were with us sailed up the river to a place called the Oyster Point, where I continued about eight months, all which time being almost starved for want of provisions. I and five more traveled through the wilderness till we came to the Tuscarora country. There, the Tuscarora Indians took us prisoners because we told them that we were bound to Roanoke. That night they carried us to their town and shut us up close, to our no small dread. The next day they entered into a consultation about us, and after it was over, their interpreter told us that we must prepare ourselves to die next morning, whereupon, being very much dejected, I spoke to this effort in the British, or Welsh, tongue. Have I escaped so many dangers? And must I now be knocked on the head like a dog? Then presently came an Indian to me, which appeared afterward to be a war captain belonging to the Seshem of the Doegs, whose original I find must needs be from the old Britons, and took me up by the middle, and told me in the British, or Welsh tongue, I should not die and thereupon went to the interpreter of Tuscarora, and agreed for my ransom and the men that were with me. They, the Doegs, then welcomed us to their town, and entertained us very civilly and cordially four months, during which time I had the opportunity of conversing with them familiarly in the British or Welsh language, and did preach to them in the same language three times a week and they would confer with me about anything that was difficult therein, and at our departure they abundantly supplied us with whatever was necessary to our support and well-doing. They are settled upon Pontigo River and not far from Cape Atros. This is a brief recital of my travels among the Doeg Indians. Morgan Jones. The son of John Jones of Basseteg, near Newport, in the county of Monmouth. I am ready to conduct any Welshman or others to the country. New York, March 10th, 1685 through 6. Other accounts of his travels among the Doegs of the Tuscarora Nation were published much earlier, but no other has been preserved. His veracity was never questioned. What shall be said of this statement? Were the remains of Prince Madaj's company represented in these Doeg Tuscaroras? He is very explicit in regard to the matter of language, and it is not easy to see how he could be mistaken. They understood his Welsh, not without needing explanation of some things, difficult therein. He was able to converse with them and preach to them in Welsh. And yet, if he got an explanation of the existence of the Welsh language among these Doegs, or sought to know anything in regard to their traditional history, he omits entirely to say so. Without meaning to doubt his veracity, one feels skeptical and desires a more intelligent and complete account of these travels. C. Antiquities of the Pacific Islands there are indications that the Pacific world had an important ancient history, and these multiply as our knowledge of that world increases. The wide diffusion of Malay dialects in the Pacific Islands suggests the controlling influence by which that ancient history was directed. The ancient remains at Easter Island are known. Two of the great images found there are now in the British Museum. All who have examined this island believe these remains were the work of a former race and that it had formerly an abundant population. It is not generally known that antiquities more important than these exist on many of the other islands of the Pacific Ocean. An educated and very intelligent gentleman who has lived many years on one of these islands and visited a considerable portion of Polynesia finds that the Pacific has antiquities which deserve attention. 
he has sent me papers containing descriptions of some of them, taken from the diary of an intelligent and observant shipmaster, much of whose life as a mariner has been passed on the Pacific. These papers were prepared for publication in a newspaper at Sydney. The gentleman sending them says in his letter, These researches are not very minute or accurate, but they indicate that there is a vast field ready for exploration in the Pacific as well as in Central America and Egypt. The papers to which I refer begin the ruins observed in an island of Ascension or Phanipe and describe the great temple at Metalonine. This was a large edifice, well built of stone and connected with canals and earthworks. Vaults, passages, and platforms, all of basaltic stones, are mentioned also. Below the pavement of the main quadrangle on opposite sides are two passages or gateways, each about ten feet square, pierced through the outer wall down to the waters of the canal. Within the walls is a central pyramidal chamber or temple with a tree growing on it. The whole ruin is now covered with trees and other vegetation. Other ruins exist in the island, one or two of which are described. Some are close upon the seashore, others are on the tops of solitary hills, and some are found on plateaus or cleared spaces far inland, but commanding views of the sea. One of the latter kind is a congeries of ruinous heaps of square stones covering at least five or six acres. It is situated on a piece of table land surrounded by dense forest growths and itself covered with low jungle. There is the appearance of a ditch in the form of a cross at the intersecting angles of which are tall mounds of ruin, of which the original form is now undistinguishable beyond the fact that the basements constructed of large stones indicate that the structures were square. The natives cannot be induced to go near this place, although it abounds in wild pigeons, which they are extremely fond of hunting. These ruined structures were not built by barbarous people, such as now inhabit the island of Ascension. There is no tradition relating to their origin or history among the present inhabitants who, it is said, attribute them to Maoli evil spirits. The great temple was occupied for a time, several generations ago, according to the natives, by the shipwrecked crew of a Spanish buccaneer, and relics of these outlaws are still found in its vaults, which they used as storehouses. On many low islands of the Marshall and Gilbert groups are curious pyramids, tall and slender, built of stones. The natives regard them with superstitious fear. The author of these papers, being a mariner, suggests that they are landmarks or relics of ancient copper-colored voyagers of the Polynesian race during their great migrations. Remarkable structures of this kind are found on... Tapateu, one of the Kingsmel Islands, and on Tinian, one of the Ladrones, where also remarkable Cyclopean structures are found. They are solid, truncated pyramidal columns, generally about 25 feet high and 10 feet square at the base. The monuments on Tinian were seen by M. Arago, who accompanied Bougainville, according to his description, they form two long colonnades, the two rows being 30 feet apart and seeming to have once been connected by something like roofing. On Swallows Island, some 12 degrees eastward of Tapateu, is a pyramid similar in construction, and on the west side of this island is a vast quadrangular enclosure of stone containing several mounds or probably edifices of some kind of which the form and contents are not known by reason of their being buried under drift sand and guano. On Strong's Island and others connected with it are ruins similar to those at Metalanin. On Lille, which is separated from Strong's Island at the harbor by a very narrow channel. There is a conical mountain surrounded by a wall some 20 feet high and of enormous thickness. The whole island appears to present a series of cyclopean enclosures 
and lines of great walls everywhere overgrown with forest. Some of the enclosures are parallelograms, 200 by 100 feet in extent. One is much larger. The walls are generally 12 feet thick, and within are vaults, artificial caverns, and secret passages. No white man is allowed to live on Lille, and strangers are forbidden to examine the ruins, in which it is supposed is concealed the plunder taken by the natives from captured or stranded ships. On the southwest side of the harbor, at Strong's Island, are many canals lined with stone. They cross each other at right angles, and the islands between their intersections were artificially raised and had tall buildings erected on them, some of which are still entire. One quadrangular tower, about 40 feet high, is very remarkable. The forest around them is dense and gloomy. The canals are broken and choked with mangroves. Not more than 500 people now inhabit these islands. Their tradition is that an ancient city formerly stood around this harbor, mostly on Lille, occupied by a powerful people whom they call Anut, and who had large vessels in which they made long voyages east and west, many moons being required for one of these voyages. Great stone structures on some of Navigator's Islands, of which the natives can give no account, are mentioned without being particularly described. Some account is given of one remarkable structure, on a mountain ridge, 1,500 feet above sea level and near the edge of a precipice 500 feet high, is a circular platform built of huge blocks of volcanic stone. It is 150 feet in diameter and about 20 feet high. On one side was the precipice and on the other a ditch that may have been originally 20 feet deep. Trees six feet in diameter are now growing in the ruins of this platform. Remarkable ruins exist on some of the Marquesas Islands, but they have not been clearly described. At first, when these antiquities were noticed by seamen, it was suggested that they were the remains of works constructed by the old buccaneers, but closer examination soon put aside this theory. Neither the buccaneers nor any other people from Europe would have constructed such works, and besides, it is manifest that they were ruins before any crew of buccaneers sailed on the Pacific. The remains on Easter Island were described by Captain Cook. It has now been discovered that such remains exist at various points throughout Polynesia, and greater familiarity with the islands will very likely bring to light many that have not yet been seen by Europeans. The author of these papers, referring to the old discarded suggestion relative to the buccaneers, says, Centuries of European occupation would have been required for the existence of such extensive remains, which are, moreover, not in any style of architecture practiced by people of the old world. It is stated that similar stonework consisting of walls, strongholds, and great enclosures exists on the eastern side of Formosa, which is occupied by a people wholly distinct in race from the Mongols who invaded and occupied the other side. The influence to which these ancient works are due seems to have pervaded Polynesia from the Marquesas Island at the east to the Ladrone and Carolina Islands at the west, and what is said of the present inhabitants of Ascension Island might have a wider application. Namely, they create on the mind of a stranger the impression of a people who have degenerated from something higher and better. At a few points in Polynesia, a small portion of the people show Mongol traits. Dark colored people, evidently of the Papuan variety, somewhat mixed with the brown race it may be, are found at various points in larger numbers. But the great body of the Polynesians are a brown race, established at a very remote period, perhaps, by a mixture of the Papuans with the Malays. 
Now take into consideration the former existence of a great Malayan Empire, the wide distribution of Malay dialects on the Pacific, and the various indications that there was formerly in Polynesia something higher and better in the condition of the people, and the ancient history indicated by these ruins will not seem mysterious, nor shall we feel constrained to treat as incredible the Central American and Peruvian traditions that ancient strangers came from the Pacific world in ships to the west coast of America for commercial intercourse with the civilized countries existing here. Ruins similar in character are found in the Sandwich Islands, but here the masonry is occasionally superior to that found elsewhere. A gentleman interested in archaeological inquiries gives the following account of a Hawaiian ruin which he visited in the interior about 30 miles from Hilo. He says he went with several companions to the hill of Kuki, which he describes as follows. The hill is so regular in its outline that it appears like a work of art, a giant effort of the mound builders. Its general form resembles very much the Pyramid of Cholulu in Mexico, and from this fact I felt a great interest in climbing it. We proceeded, Conway, Eldhart, Kaiser and I, on foot up the grassy slope of the hill. There was an absence of all volcanic matter. No stone on the hill except what had been brought there by the hand of man. As we arrived near the summit, we came upon great square blocks of hewn stone overgrown by shrubbery, and on reaching the summit, we found that it had been leveled and squared according to the cardinal points and paved. We found two square blocks of hewn stone embedded in the earth in an upright position, some 15 feet apart, and ranging exactly east and west. Over the platform was rank grass, and a grove of coconuts some hundred years old. Examining farther, I found that the upper portion of the hill had been terraced. The terraces near the summit could be distinctly traced, and they had evidently been faced with hewn stone. The stones were in perfect squares, if not less than three feet in diameter, many of them of much greater size. They were composed of a dark, vitreous basalt, the most durable of all stone. It is remarkable that every slab was faced and polished upon every side so that they could fit together like sheets of paper. They reminded me much of the polished stones in some of the walls at Tiwanaku and other ruins in Peru. Many of the blocks were lying detached. Probably some had been removed, but there were still some 30 feet of the facing on the lower terrace partly in position but all showed the ravages of time and earthquakes and were covered with accumulated soil, grass, and shrubbery. Conway and myself, in descending the hill, had our attention attracted by a direct line of shrubbery running from the summit to the base of the hill, on the western side, to the coconut grove below. Upon examination, we found it to be the remains of a stairway, evidently of hewn stone that had led from the foot of the hill to the first terrace, a height of nearly 300 feet. Within this stairway near the base, we found a coconut tree growing more than 200 years old, the roots pressing out the rocks. The site for a temple is grand and imposing, and the view extensive, sweeping the ocean, the mountains, and the great lava plain of Puna. It was also excellent in a military point of view as a lookout. From the summit, it appeared as an ancient green island around which had surged and rolled a sea of lava, and so it evidently has been. By whom and when was this hill terraced and these stones hewn? There is a mystery hanging around this hill which exists nowhere else in the Sandwich Islands. The other structures so numerously scatter over the groups are made of rough stone. There is no attempt at a terrace. There is no flight of steps leading to them. There is no hewn or polished stone, nor is there any evidence of the same architectural skill evinced. They are the oldest ruins yet discovered, 
and were evidently erected by a people considerably advanced in arts, acquainted with the use of metallic instruments, the cardinal points, and some mathematical knowledge. Were they the ancestors of the present Hawaiians, or of a different race that has passed away? He inquired of the oldest natives concerning the history of this ruin, but they could give only vague and confused traditions in regard to it, and these were contradictory. The only point on which they agreed was that it had never been used within the memory of man. They also said there was another old structure of the same kind in Kona, whose history is lost. The language of the Sandwich Islands is so manifestly a dialect of the Malayan tongue that the influence of the Malays must have been paramount in these islands in ancient times. D. Deciphering the Inscriptions in the Actes de la Société Philologique, Paris, from March 1870, Monsignor H. de Cherency gives some particulars of his attempt to decipher fragments of one or two very brief inscriptions on the bas-relief of the cross at Palenque. I know nothing of his qualifications for this work, but he appears to have studied the characters of the Maya alphabet preserved and explained by Landa. It is seen, however, that his attempt to decipher the inscriptions is a complete failure. In fact, he professes to have done no more than reproduce two or three words in Roman characters. He gives us Hunab Ku, Esnab, and Kukulkan as words found on the cross. Esnab is supposed to be the name of a month, or of a day of the week, and the other names of divinities. He finds that the characters of the inscriptions are not in all respects identical to those found in Landa, and that Landa's list, especially when tested by the inscriptions, is incomplete. There is not absolute certainty in regard to the name Kukulkan. Nevertheless, M. D. Sharency makes this speculative use of it. The presence of the name Kukulkan on the bas-relief of the cross is important in a historical point of view. The name of this demigod, which signifies the serpent with the Quetzal plumes, is the Maya form of the Mexican name Quetzalcoatl, which has precisely the same meaning. But, we know that the name and worship of this god were brought to the high plateaus of Central America towards the ninth century of our era. Consequently, the bas-relief in question cannot be more ancient. This assumes that the worship of Kukulkan was never heard of by the Mayas until the Aztecs arrived in Mexico, an assumption for which there is no warrant and which proceeds in utter disregard of facts. It was the Aztecs who had never heard of Kukulkan, or at least had not adopted his worship previous to this time. The Aztecs, when they settled in Ahuac, did not impart new ideas, religion, or culture to anybody. On the contrary, they received much of the civilization of their new neighbors, which was more advanced than their own. It is very certain that neither the Mayas nor the Quiches borrowed anything from them. We need not go back so far as the ninth century to find the time when the Aztecs adopted, or at least organized in Mexico, the worship of Kukulkan, whose name they transformed into Quetzalcoatl. His worship did not begin with them. They did not introduce it. They found it in the country as a very ancient worship and adopted their form of it from the people who yielded to their sway. If M. D. Sharency will inquire with a little more care, he will discover that Kukulkan was one of the very oldest personages in Central American mythology as Khan was one of the oldest in that of Peru. Kukulkan sometimes as Zamna, was associated with almost 
everything in civilization. He introduced the beginnings of civilized life, invented the art of writing, and was to the Central Americans not wholly unlike what Thoth was to the Egyptians and Tautas or Taut to the Phoenicians. If the bas relief of the cross at Palenque were half as old as his worship in Central America, it would be far more ancient than anyone has supposed. This now concludes the reading of Ancient America in Notes on American Archaeology by John D. Baldwin.